Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Tom Barnico returning for video blog post number four on Sunday, December 12th of 2021. Yes, I did decide to uh, change my background uh, by adding some Christmas spirit, uh, probably the only Christmas spirit you will find um, for me, not a big decoration person, but I thought, well, might as well spruce it up a little bit for the uh, TCAOA basketball officials. So we're in week two, uh, or we just got done with week two of girls. We just got done with week one of boys. Hopefully everyone's happy, healthy, uh, injury-free at this point with the holidays coming up. We've still got a couple weeks of games left. Uh, and I thought this would be an opportune time to talk about the MHA's, MHSAA's Basketball Apparel Guide. Uh, as you can see, this was last updated October 1st of 2019, but obviously this is what we're working with. This is uh, what is dictating all of our adjudication of penalties when it comes to basketball apparel, both for uh, girls and boys. Now, I, I say all of this fully understanding that no one wants to be the fashion police. No one in our association, no one in the state of Michigan, no one in any of the 50 United States, uh, high school, middle school, college, NBA, no one wants to be the fashion police. No one likes it. No one enjoys it. There is no official that you will probably encounter that will say, boy, I, I really like uh, having to take time to investigate each and every player's apparel and accessories. It just, it doesn't happen. No one, no one likes playing fashion police. But the reality of the situation is, is that this, the, these guidelines are in the rule book, they're in the case book. And just because we don't like playing fashion police, it doesn't mean that we don't have to play fashion police. There's a, a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot. There's, there's a few rules that I don't necessarily agree with. I don't like the three-point line in the game of basketball. If it were up to me and I had a magic wand, I would eradicate the three-point line altogether. But that's the game of basketball. That's the rules. And uh, we are paid to adjudicate those rules. So that carries over to basketball apparel. So as it says here in the first paragraph, for all instances, when a player's apparel does not conform to the restrictions or requirements outlined in the rules and guide, the player shall not be allowed to participate until the violation is corrected. If an apparel violation is noticed as the player is being subbed into the game, they will not be allowed to enter until the violation is corrected. If an apparel violation is noticed with a player already in the game, they will be directed to correct the violation. If it cannot be corrected in a reasonable amount of time, the player will be removed from the court or substituted for it and will not be allowed to re-enter until the violation is corrected. Now, I'll give you my own personal experience from just this past week. Um, I was working with Paul Sevilla and Travis Garbolinski at Claire. They were playing far well. Um, one of the things that you've heard me advocate for uh, before is watching all the players during pregame warmups to see if you can see uh, any illegal apparel or miscolored accessories or any of the like. While the three of us were, were pregaming, it wasn't obvious that six Farwell players were wearing illegal undershirts. And the reason being is because they were wearing warmups as most teams do nowadays. So it's not a matter of asking players to take off their warmups during pregame. Okay, that's, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is even during the pregame where uh, announcements are happening and players finally will remove their warmups and you see that players have illegal undershirts on, in this case, they were black undershirts with purple jerseys, so obviously they were not allowable. We advocate for uh, course correcting the coach um, and or the players. Again, if it's pregame and they're doing layup lines, you can probably connect with the players. If it's pregame and they are in, uh, in line for 
starting lineups, then you might go to the coach and say, coach, this player's um, undershirt is unacceptable, or this player's arm sleeve that I couldn't see before has, it doesn't match the rest of his or her teammates. In, in, in our situation, the one that Paul and Travis and I were going through, uh, there were six players on Farwell's roster that had illegal, uh, illegally colored undershirts. So we were able to get to the coach before we tossed to have the players go to the locker room, take off their undershirts and come back either with the correct colored undershirt or no undershirt at all, right? We want to try to be as um, accepting as possible for players who have illegal colored undershirts, leg sleeves, headbands, whatever the case may be. If it takes them 60 to 90 seconds to remove the attire, that's fine. And that's what happened in our game. They ran into the locker room, they changed in 30 seconds, they were back out in plenty of time for us to toss. But if it slows down the game, or if you actually have to stop the game, that's where this intro paragraph comes into play where you will ask the player or you will ask the coach, excuse me, to substitute for the player until that player is properly equipped. Now, I feel personally that it's important uh, before the game starts to um, not only, I shouldn't say before the game starts, early in the season, we want to make sure that we um, are well aware of what's illegal and not illegal and enforce it. Enforce it with um, tact, enforce it very calmly, but enforce it nonetheless. Because we don't want to be the crew or the official responsible for the situation continuing to permeate five, six weeks later. You know, if, if we are in the second week of January, and there is a team that is still wearing illegal apparel or miscolored apparel, my thought is the officials who officiated the six or seven games before the game that I'm working maybe didn't catch it, didn't do a good enough job of adjudicating it. Now, again, I understand that this might be a one-off situation, but me personally, I don't want to feel like I am handing off being the fashion police to someone who officiates after me if I can course correct the behavior in week one, week two, week three, or realistically any week of the season. Okay, so I want us to be hyper vigilant, especially early in the season when it comes to correcting um, illegal apparel and miscolored apparel. So when you look at some of the general uniform guidelines here, I apologize, I didn't mean to scroll that far down, so bear with me. Um, you know, when we're looking at general uniform, general uniform, the, the first thing is rolled waistbands. And there's been a lot of uh, conjecture back and forth about what is and isn't acceptable. As it states here, rolled waistbands are legal as long as there are no exposed drawstrings and comply with the restrictions on logos. So on the left-hand picture, you'll see all of these rolled waistbands would be illegal because they either have exposed drawstrings or they do not comply with restrictions on logos. So we need to make sure if a player has rolled waistbands, which most every player does now, it used to just be a girls basketball thing, but it's carried over now. I've seen pretty much every boys team over the past couple of seasons roll their waistbands as well. So regardless of whether they want to tuck their drawstring in over the top of the rolled waistband, or if they're rolling their waistband so much that it covers the drawstring altogether, uh, the, that's, that's fine. That's, that's legal. And the reason we want to uh, hide those drawstrings is to prevent injury. It's the same thing I'll talk here in a minute about the tails on the headbands. It's the same concept here. We need to make sure that there's nothing exposed that uh, players can't catch their fingers in or, you know, a, a shoe or whatever the case may be 
We just need to make sure that if they are rolling their waistbands, that the drawstrings are hidden. Uh, numbers on shorts, individual players' numbers are permitted on shorts. That was a change that was made back in 2019, so um, nothing spectacular there. Now we get to undergarments, under shirts and under shorts. So under shirts must be a single solid co color similar to the color of the torso of the uniform shirt, okay? So again, if you're wearing white jerseys, you have to wear white undershirts. Back to our example earlier, we had purple jerseys with black undershirts. While not all members of the team must wear undershirts, undershirts worn by different members of the same team shall be similar in color with one another. So again, you can't have uh, a white undershirt with a black undershirt. Uh, frankly, it would be dependent, the color of the undershirt is dependent on the color of the upper torso jersey anyway. So you have to abide by that. Explo exposed sleeves shall not be frayed or slit. Uh, the ends must be hemmed. So no cut off t-shirts unless they're hemmed on the end. And the sleeve lengths for each individual player shall be the same length. I re can remember a couple of seasons ago where there was a team, I forget who it was, but every player on the team had adequately colored undershirts, but one sleeve was cut off, one sleeve was um, remained on. And not only did it look stupid, it was illegal. Um, sleeve lengths are not required to have the same sleeve lengths between them, i.e. some players may have short sleeves while other players may have longer sleeves. So you might have some players who wear long sleeves down to their wrist. You might have other players who wear the hemmed sleeveless shirt. You might have some players wearing the um, typical short sleeve shirt. All of those are legal as long as the sleeve lengths for each player are the same and the color of the undershirt matches the color of the jersey. Now let's talk about undershorts because here's where some of this gets very tricky. Visible compression shorts or tights must match the color of any or all accessories or meet accessory color requirements if no accessories are worn for both the individual player and for all teammates. Now, here's where this comes into play. So I go back to our game. I think it was the same game if it was Paul and Travis, if I'm not mistaken. Players are wearing shorter shorts now, okay? It used to be they wore the long baggy shorts like the Fab Five used to wear at Michigan. Now they're wearing the short Bobby Knight Indiana shorts. So somewhere along the lines, uh, players decided that they wanted to show more of their quad and hamstrings. I'm not really sure why, but that's the reality of the situation. So our situation from the other night, we had a player who you couldn't see his undershorts uh, until he hiked up the legs of, of his shorts. So the undershorts weren't hanging down below the um, below the length of the short. So you couldn't see the undershort below the length of the short when it was normal. But when he hiked them up, I believe it was uh, his undershorts were purple camo, okay? And we had a discussion about this. And at the time I had mentioned to, I, couldn't, I can't remember whether it was Paul or Travis, but I had mentioned to them that those particular undershorts were legal because they, uh, we couldn't see them past the uh, regular shorts of the jersey. As I was reflecting back on that though, that player made it um, his, his goal to hike his, short, his shorts up as high as he could on a regular basis. So again, as I reflect back on that, we probably should have made him change his undershorts because his undershorts were visible for uh, significant lengths of time, okay? So obviously, if you can't see the shorts past the length of, if you can't see the undershorts past the length of the regular shorts, probably not worthy of saying anything. However, if the shorts are naturally hanging below the, um, if the undershorts are 
hanging below the shorts of the jersey, then you will need to change them. The other thing too is if you can see that it is clearly apparent that the player is doing his best to either roll his shorts up so that they're as short as possible, or he's constantly somehow controlling the length of his jersey shorts so that they are above his undershorts, then you need to have them take them off and replace them with either shorts that are the color of the jersey or no undershorts at all. All right. So again, that's why I say I'm, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect at um, assessing what's right and what's wrong. But the reality is, is if you're questioning what's going on in the game, reflect on it, have some self-awareness and say, A happened, so let me critically think and problem solve and understand what the nature and the logic and the interpretation of the rule is. And if we have to course correct during the game, then we should, okay? So maybe at first, it's a matter of saying something to the player. If you are going to continually wear your jersey shorts so that I can see your compression shorts underneath, then you're going to have to have compression shorts that match the color of your jersey shorts. However, if your compression shorts are high enough on your leg that I can't see them when you are naturally wearing your shorts, I'm not going to worry about it. But again, it's interpretation. It's what is that individual player doing? And how within or outside of the rules is that situation putting you as an officiating crew in? So again, and I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about uh, some of the logic behind this because it's, it's not a perfect system and we always have to be willing to course correct. Just like we were uh, the other night. Now, again, unfortunately, uh, I had mentioned something to, again, Paul or Travis, I'm not really sure. And we, we, we had it, we let it go for the rest of the game. It wasn't until we were on the drive back home. And once I was actually back home that I was able to reflect and say, okay, is that with, is, is that the actual um, interpretation of the rule is that's, is that what was intended? And after I thought about it for a while, um, I, I came to the conclusion that's not what the rule intended. Accessories such as sleeves, neoprene compression garments for arms, legs, knees, and elbows, headbands, and wristbands must be a single solid color of white, black, beige, or other predominant color of the uniform shirt. Any and all accessories worn by individual players must be the same color and any accessory worn must be the same color for all teammates. So I think back to the example of maybe you have a, a group of uh, girls basketball players on one team, eight of them are wearing black headbands, one is wearing a white arm sleeve and one is wearing a black leg sleeve. So how do you, how do you go about getting all of them to wear the same color? My first step is going to be to talk to the one girl who has the white arm sleeve on and say, you have nine teammates who are wearing black accessories. If you can convince them to all wear white, I, I invite you to do so. If you can't convince them to all wear white, you are going to have to change into either a black accessory or no accessory at all. And those accessories have to be a solid color. The, the three um, examples here, we have black with uh, white accents, white with black accents, and multicolor. None of these are acceptable, all right? Um, as it says here, all of these players, the, the two pictures here on the left, all of these players are wearing legal accessories. They are a single solid color and match any other accessory or visible undershorts or tights. Uh, on the right here, these accessories, headbands, do not match the tights and would therefore be illegal. So this uh, player here on the left uh, appears to be wearing a white headband with orange leg sleeves. This player on the right is wearing a black headband with white leg sleeves. So both are illegal because they all have to be the same color. Uh, detached sleeves, sleeves including padded compression style, 
are not to be considered medical braces. They must comply with color restrictions for all other accessories. So braces obviously have um, you know, some additional elements to them. Uh, these are just leg sleeves with extra padding in them. Now, as it says here on the note on the right-hand side, if a player's sleeve is accompanied by a doctor's note or a prescription, it will be allowed without regard to color restrictions and requirements. Most of the time, if not all of the time though, this is just a, another way to get a, a leg sleeve or an arm sleeve into the game. But they have to, if they're padded, they have to follow the same color schematics as all of the other accessories. Scroll down next to headbands. So non-abrasive material, cloth elastic or pre-wrap, no more than three inches in width, may be used as a band around the head. Headbands with tails and knots are not permitted to be worn during contests. Okay, so on the left, this is considered a headband, and not a hair restraining device because it encompasses the entire head. It is legal, but must still comply with all color restrictions and requirements. On the right, the headband is illegal. Headbands may not include knots or tails. This eliminates the use of any headband that must be tied around the head. Now, I don't see these headbands as much uh, or as prevalent, I should say, as um, we used to. Uh, four or five years ago, these were showing up in a lot of high school gyms. And we had to ask people to untuck, or I'm sorry, to uh, remove these headbands because they, they were tied in the back. Okay. And you know, it was, do we allow the, the tails to be tucked? Do we allow them not to be tucked? What should we do here? The reality of the situation is these headbands that have the knots in the back of them, okay, now headbands, all right? I know there's some misinterpretation. I did check with the MHSAA. Pre-wrap with a small knot in the back is acceptable, okay? Pre-wrap only with a small knot in the back is acceptable. Headbands that are tied with knots in the back and with tails, whatever the case may be, are not acceptable. And here's, here's kind of how to think about this. So these headbands have much, much bigger knots in them than the pre-wrap does, okay? The other thing, these headbands, when, when, when the knots are bigger like this, it becomes much harder and, and firmer laying against the back of the head. And then you introduce tails into the equation and we're talking about the same thing we talked about with the waistbands earlier with the drawstrings. So when it comes right down to it, the only thing that can be tied in the back of the head, according to the MHSA, is pre-wrap with a very small unobtrusive knot in the back. Wristbands, moisture absorbing wristbands, not more than four inches wide may be worn only below the elbow and are limited to one per arm. So uh, you can see on the left, you have a wristband that is less than four inches wide and it is worn on the wrist. Uh, in the middle picture, I believe this is Chris Paul back when he played with the Los Angeles Clippers. He has illegal wristbands, which appear to be those Livestrong type of wristband uh, material. Obviously not allowed. And then on the right, we have Kobe Bryant wearing a uh, wristband uh, slightly above the elbow, not acceptable. There's also now these bicep bands, not legal. Uh, there's also players who like to wear wristbands above the elbow, not legal. The, 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 smaller, the, the smaller wristbands that are maybe an inch in width, they like to make those into bicep bands above the elbow, not legal. Okay. Hair control devices, uh, head, heart, excuse me, hard and or sharp items are not permitted. Uh, there are no color restrictions and requirements for hair control devices. This only applies to items that are solely and specifically designed to restrict hair, not headbands. So headbands have to follow the color logo, um, you know, not tail guidelines. These hair control devices 
do not. However, this is why it's so important to actively pregame and watch each and every player, girls or boys, if they have anything in their hair, make sure that it's soft. I had a situation uh, a couple of weeks ago where we had a girl, uh, much like this picture on the right, who had a hair control device, but it was very hard. It was one of those plastic clips, but it was very hard and it had um, uh, it had spring uh, a spring in it, okay? Made her take it off. It was very hard to see because it very closely matched the color of her hair. But that's why it's important to investigate these things before the game, before injuries occur. Um, the decorative bow is illegal because of the knot that is included and the tails that extend. Shoes and socks don't fall into any color restrictions. They are exempt from any color or logo restrictions and individual players are not required to match their teammates. So socks is uh, kind of out of the equation altogether. And there can be some very questionable uh, color schemes for socks. Jewelry is not allowed. Taping over jewelry is not allowed. Um, so jewelry is prohibited even if it is taped. If an athlete is wearing a religious medal, it must be taped to the body and under the uniform. If an athlete is wearing a medical alert, it must be taped to the body and visible. Uh, both of these are not considered jewelry. So I don't, it, it doesn't matter if the jewelry is taped or not, unless it's a religious medal or a uh, med alert bracelet, um, it has to be taped to the body. Team and manufacturer's logos, uh, the, the size of the logo is limited to two and one quarter inch square. Now, I'm not gonna take a tape measure out with me um, to start the game and measure everyone's uh, logo, but if, if a logo is too big, you will very clearly know that that logo is, is far too big. There are no numbers allowed on a player's apparel except for the player number located on the uniform shirt or shorts. Um, so a couple pretty standard things there that have been in place for quite a while. Protective equipment, uh, braces, manufactured knee and ankle braces are not subject to color or logo restrictions. Braces can be made of a variety of materials and include one or more devices or inserts to support the joint. It may include hinges, straps, or an opening over the kneecap. Padded compression sleeves that we talked about earlier are not considered braces and are subject to color and logo restrictions. I had a very good e-conversation with a couple of officials about the um, patella bands. Um, hopefully everyone knows what I'm talking about. They're bands that you wear right below the kneecap in order to keep your patella in place. Those do not fall um, under, a, th those are not considered leg sleeves, okay? Those are considered uh, a, a device for, for medical purposes. Now, it has to be right under the kneecap. You know, if it's worn around the calf itself or around the ankle, that is not what the intention uh, is for that particular device or that particular band, okay? The band has to be worn immediately below the kneecap in order to be considered for medical purposes. And it doesn't follow any color restrictions. Now, a good question that I had was, can, can a player use pre-wrap as a patella band? And the answer is yes, okay? Players can use pre-wrap as a patella band. Uh, there's actually a lot of medical literature um, I, I, you know, I, I've checked with a couple of athletic trainers that I'm personally personal friends with, and they have said that pre-wrap can be a very effective um, patella band, and they actually recommend it now over some uh, manufactured patella bands, okay? So hopefully everyone knows what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the patella bands. Uh, some of them come with Velcro on them, some of them tie. Um, again, there's a lot of players are using pre-wrap now. Whatever the case may be, in order to be considered a legal patella band, it has to be right below the kneecap because that is what that band is meant to do. It's, it's meant to help keep the kneecap, the patella, all of that structure, the knee structure in place. Okay, so that was a really good question that uh, we had some great dialogue about, and um, it was very timely as we were talking about all of these accessories and, and items.
Okay. So uh, if you see this video before you get the email, uh, I will be emailing out a copy of this apparel guide. Please feel free to reach out at any time and let me know if you have questions. Again, good luck the next couple of weeks before we get to the holiday. I'll be sending out a couple more videos, but hopefully these continue to be helpful and insightful. And if they're not, call, call shoot me a text, email me, let me know that uh, stop producing your video blogs, Tom, because they don't provide any value to my officiating career. And I will um, discontinue production. Okay. So Santa says, uh, have a safe and happy week. And we'll see you guys here next week.